All right, make sure it's recording there. If somebody kind of keeps an eye here, if you see this change to record, I need to start it again. Um, my computer is a little off today, but we'll see what we can do. Um, what so, color will it be when it changes? It'll stop flashing. Oh, okay. It'll be like, it'll say record, like it won't hit it to record. Like it, it should be recording right now. Anyway, this is going to cover some hologram stuff. And um, this is my, and like I said, this is my understanding. I've tried to incorporate as many pictures as possible to help the understanding of it. And uh, we'll go from there. And like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Doing the hologram grok. So, do you really know, what in, you know, y'all heard me talk about the matrix before, so I'm really big into the matrix, but um, the matrix to me ties into a lot of this, because you can look at the matrix as being a movie about the hologram, um, as far as plugging into a virtual reality, which is what the hologram is, and having an experience, um, and some people think maybe you're captured and things like that, I don't think so. So this is um, Morpheus, the god of sleep in Greek mythology. So do you want to know what it is? The matrix is everywhere. It's all around us. Even now in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your TV. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You can take the blue pill and the story ends. You wake up in bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And literally, some of the stuff I'll be saying tonight, you know the whole thing about court, you know whether to have the lawyers, you know, debating about a particular issue, and the uh, lawyer says something and then the other one goes, objection. You know, that's a great loophole because whenever something is said, even if it's ob objected to by another lawyer, it's still in the mind of the jury. Um, so, literally, this stuff will begin to work on your mind as it's been working on my mind for quite some time. Um, and you just can't go back. If you le learn something really deep, it changes the way reality is for you on a deep level. Once you fully get it and grok it, which is, just means you, you, it's like when you become so much with information, you become one with it that it's a part of you. So what is a hologram? This is from Wikipedia. Um, holography, which comes from the Greek word uh, holos, which is whole, uh, and graph, which means writing. So it's like a whole writing or a um, drawing, uh, is a technique which enables three-dimensional images to be made. It involves the use of laser, interference, diffraction, light intensity recording, and suitable illumination for the rec recording. The image changes as the position or, and orientation of the viewer system changes in exactly the same way as if the object were still present, thus making the image appear three-dimensional. And what it is is like you're looking at a 2D picture, but if you look at it, it's like you can get all the way around it just from a simple 2D media. The holographic uh, recording itself is not an image, and that's really important to get. It basically consists of um, apparently random structure of either varying intensity, uh, density or profile. Basically, it's just a, a film with a bunch of information recorded on it. And that's what the matrix is, the hologram. The field is just a huge field of information. And we're going to go over how you pull out certain information. If you look at the word information, it's in form. So all this information is stored and we pull it out of the hologram in form as physical reality. What is a hologram? A hologram is basically information stored on or in a medium. There can be many images of information in a holographic media. What appears out of the hologram is the part highlighted by the angle, type, and density, and intensity of light. So if you look at a hologram a particular way, you see a certain vantage point. Um, overlaying that into our reality, we highlight in the hologram what what we are projecting into it. So it's the so to translate that to a particular part, what we're highlighting in the angle is our perceptions of the hologram. You could say the angles, types, and intensity of light are your, our opinions, perceptions, beliefs, judgments, and expectations. 
Quantum physics has proved that more than 90% of the physical world is empty space. And what I'm presenting, the idea is that all this empty space is the hologram. Of course, physical reality is too. It all works together. So the empty space is like a medium that we're pulling things out of all the time. Um, and since it's empty space, that's why I, I started using the word hologram for hologram. And the words to me go together. It's just like a hollow empty space. Message isn't any empty space. Like a telegram, hollow space. So there's empty space. There's lots of information embedded in there. Uh, basically, it's infinite uh, information form in virtually empty space. Does that say angels? It does say angels. Typo, okay. maybe. Yeah. Infinite. Uh, Your brain reads what it wants to do. Yeah. It's very easy to see angles out of that. But yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's no, you're right. Um, I caught that on another page, but I, I didn't catch it here. Infinite information is stored in virtually empty space. This information is then accessed and activated by our opinions, perceptions, belief, judgments, and expectations. So, how is a hologram recorded or created? Basically, there's a beam of light that is sent through a splitter. The uh, first half of the beam hits an object and then go, is projected onto a screen, usually a film, and then the other split goes into a mirror. So you have two, two reference points coming into one medium. Okay? That's how it's recorded. Um, and I think actually, for my perception of, as I was writing this, I think we're actually writing into the hologram ourselves all the time. So it's not like we're just pulling information out, we're writing in it too. And these reference points, you could even, you know, the here concept of the mirror out in the world. So here's your mirror, here's your reference point. So I think we're actually recording information in the hologram all the time. And then what happens is, so in other words, it's a dynamic kind of hologram that keeps writing and expanding and creating itself and adding more and more possibilities. So there may not even been like one being that created it, we're collectively perpetuating it in different ways. So as we have experiences, we like leave a path or we leave that information in the field for other people to access. Like people talk about, you know, like 500 people or, you know, thousands of people have been Cleopatra. It could be that they were just pulling out that information out of the hologram because they resonated it with some way. Uh, and as a resonating aspect, they felt like it was maybe a past life. That's it in a nutshell. Um, how is a hologram, uh, how is a hologram, hmm. so you can see I did this pretty quickly. <laughs> um, how is a hologram recorded or re created? Uh, they call it a recording because you're creating a uh, recording information on a media. Have you ever seen those, uh, those books where you have the 2D images? You know, the 3D images where you cross your eyes, adjust your eyes, and an image pops out of it? Well, here on the left is one of those book pages, and here on the right is like your typical... Um, holographic film. You would then shine a light on here to get the information. Just looking at these, you don't see anything, which is another perspective of the hologram, is only what you resonate with, your perception, your type of beam that resonates with a particular thing is going to pull things out of reality. In other words, not everything is going to show up. It's only going to show up when you look at it a certain way. So here's a close-up picture of a holographic uh, surface. The object in the hologram is a toy van. It is no more possible to discern the subject of a hologram from its pattern than it is to identify what music has been recorded by looking at a surface of a CD. So the hologram, you know, we look out into empty space and we see nothing because we're not necessarily reading that information. But you know when you start getting, getting in touch with energy work, you know, maybe even start seeing chakras and things like that, you're just tuning into information that was there all along. You're just pulling it now out of the field and beginning to play with it. You've downloaded the proper software. Yeah. <laughs> you've downloaded the proper software, like Stephen said, or you've worked enough with it and you've developed your system to do that. So you can't read it when it's just out there. So imagine looking at the sky. You know, I've been playing with this mind trip lately. So you look out into the physical world and you know, just start playing with the idea that the whole thing is a hologram and that all of it, which means all of it is mutable. It's all changeable. Um, things can be downloaded into a hologram just like in the movie Matrix. Information can be downloaded. I think a lot of the times, most of the time, people download information, especially in this group when you're doing a healing session, you get something like intuitive from people. 
Um, the more you play with it, you're able to download information from these other fields because you're tuning into it. And it, the light doesn't have to be your eyes. It can be your mind, because your mind beams just as much as your eyes do. So when we're sitting here, like, and you see me tapping on somebody, I'm looking in different directions. I'm not consciously looking for something, but it, I, I've caught myself doing that, and I know that's what's happening. It's like I'm beaming out into there. I don't, like, see anything. I, some people might see stuff, but how I, how I get the information just shows up in my head. So I'm, like, looking around. It's like accessing that information for the hologram based on that person. I get the download into my mind and then that gives me something to work with the person. To me, that's how it works, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna even get a deeper aspect of that. Is it, are everybody with me so far? So you, you, you create this, huge, this hologram by projecting two points, one is the object, one is a reference, onto a film and you store information. And I think that's our life too. We being the reference point, we see something and we're affecting the hologram, we're affecting what's recorded there. Like just think about our lives. In one way, you could say, in the hologram, our life, or our lives, will be recorded forever to be accessed by someone. It's almost like, you know the memories in your mind, you know, when they, if you're seeing where they hypnotize somebody, and somebody says, like, they don't, they don't remember a particular thing, but you can hypnotize somebody right to a specific point, and that information is there. It's just that their mind is not consciously focusing on it. Information is never lost. So anything that ever happens to us, or ever has happened, is in the hologram. And I think that we're writing it all the time. We're writing new stories into it, new experiences. And if you get into the concept of multi-universes or multiple lives and parallels, it's th the possibilities are infinite. How to bring a hologram to life. So if you just have a, 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 a 2D, we're using 2D as the example right now. Our hologram is way more advanced than that. It's not 2D. Um, it's much more in-depth. But to bring that information out, Light is needed in order to see a hologram in, imprinted in a particular media. For example, squinting your eyes when you're looking at a picture, what you're doing is you're adjusting the wavelength of what your eyes are seeing and what you're doing in a, that particular case is you're overlapping frequencies that give you an image. Okay? Um, and the crazy thing about the eyes, you know, when, you're, when you first start using your eyes, you see things upside down. And then over time, your mind corrects it. I forget the guy's name, maybe some of y'all know, but he did some research where he took a group of people and he had them wear these glasses where the world was upside down for them, literally, what they saw. And I can't remember the time period, but after a while, they started seeing upright again with these glasses. Three days. Three days. Took the glasses off, same thing. They had to, like, readjust. So we're always adjusting to this hologram that's out there. And bringing in that whole concept of, like, the third eye and, you know, the pituitary sitting in the Ark of the Covenant right here. You know, you could say that's one aspect of our tuner, is we're projecting out into reality and receiving back what we're projecting. So in those books, you're squinting your eyes, you're adjusting with the light, by the, you know, your eyes are letting light in or out um, in the 3D books. And like if you're reading the information on a CD, you're using like a laser to activate that information. Or with a regular just 2D hologram, you shine a light, usually a particular frequency, to make that image pop out. The image is there, you just need that light to activate it to be seen. So basically, in metaphysical terms, that light is one's consciousness, and the squinting and the adjusting of that is how your perceptions, belief, beliefs, and concepts are adjusting how much light you're putting into something, the intensity of it, the flavor of it, the emotional, all that changes what you pull out of the hologram. This here on the right is an actual, this is actually um, one, I got this from Wikipedia. This is one hologram. It's a 2D, like a picture, okay, it's 2D. And they're, they're, of course they're lighting it up, that's why it has a particular color. Um, in the olden days of the, or the beginning days of the holog uh, holographic stuff, you would, um, you have to use a particular color. So you didn't get like real in-depth color, you just get like here is amber. But what's interesting about this is it's the, it's the same picture, I mean, it's two different angles of the same piece of holographic material. So basically, it's like this, and I'm looking over here, I take a picture, I see something. I walk over here, look at this, take a picture, I get a different picture. But you can see how, uh, how three-dimensional that one object looks within a 2D. So basically, you can walk all the way around that sucker in the 2D, which is a lot of information stored in a small amount of space. 
and think about how um, we're actually doing that with our own computers and things. Um, like I've, I've seen these thumb drives online and they're up to 300 gigabytes on a thumb drive. That's bigger than most people's computer, okay? Um, most computers are, you know, around 100 or so, if, if maybe 80. I mean, we're not too, one of my first ones is like probably 50. <laughs> so here's this like 300 in this one space. Uh, when I was doing this, um, I, I had a lot of things coming to me and in the amount of time that I had to do this, I had to like filter some things out. But what came to mind is um, I never really watched the first Star Trek much, but the Star Trek The Next Generation, I got hooked on a couple of the episodes. There was one episode, and some of y'all may remember this, where um, these two people in, the, in their hollow deck actually as wanted to escape and have their own lives. Well, in the very end of that movie, what they did is they kind of tricked them into this box device that they had loaded as many experiences as they could have in, in an entire lifetime. So basically, they gave them an entire life in this small little box. So they were living in there, still in the hologram, thinking that they had escaped and were having their life and having this adventure. Hmm, pretty interesting. <laughs> so, um, going beyond 2D, what if all the empty space out there is the hologram, the recording media, that all information is stored in and the physical world is pulled out of? So what I'm saying, and Nassim talked about you know, the black hole. We've even watched that video of the black hole. And uh, this also ties in uh, to Carlos, I always want to say his um, last name, Castanegas? Castaneda. Castaneda, okay. He talked about the imperial egg around somebody. Really, it's the same energy field. He knew about it, he just called it something else. And he even talks about you projecting onto this egg in 360 angles, and that is your reality, okay? So literally, the field that we're in, this toroidal field, we're projecting out into, and it's all around us. It's like a huge IMAX type of scene. We do it ourselves on a smaller scale, and then we, then we live within a huge IMAX theater. So our, our perceptions are pulling out of the hologram what we're plugged into. Um, and I believe Nassim Haramine found and best describes the hologram, the field, the matrix construct. Uh, he at least verified what I had found in the study of the chakra system. And how I got into Nassim's in information is I was doing a search because I was like, uh, I started looking at the chakra system another way, like the toroidal field, and I was, then, then I came across the information that it's like a black hole. And I go, holy crap. I said, our heart is a singularity. So I, I was thinking, I was feeling like I was really wise, and I was, I was going to get some pictures to put together for a presentation like this I do. And I come across this guy that's already talking about the same language I was coming into. And that's an aspect of that hologram thing because it's infinite information. All the uh, different people can group together, not even connected, but around the planet and plug into different realities. So different belief systems, different belief constructs we tap into. Uh, just like uh, I have to work really hard to make a living. That is a holographic experience that you can plug into and have, and it doesn't matter where you are or who you are, you plug into that. So I came across Nassim's information based on what I was looking for to, for some pictures and stuff. And, uh, of course, we know now he's calling that, that structure uh, the black hole structure. And if you look at a black hole, it's the exact same structure as this. It's actually, this is called a toroidal field. And what's really interesting is the Torah part here, which I'll pull in later. And then when I was putting this together, I never noticed it before. But you know how all, I like all the words and everything, right? I was looking at Nassim. And Nassim's name caught me off guard this time. And I looked at his name, and here you have, I am, para, me, in. And I had read Barbara Brennan's book, Hands of Light, Jeez, when I first got into massage therapy. And ahara is an energetic line. You see it on this picture here on the left. It goes deeper than the chakra system, and it has uh, particular points upon it, the Godhead, Earth core, your heart crystal, and that's called a hara line. So, which is the very center of the black hole heart thing. Just like Dr. Emoto, you know, Dr. Emoto started doing the pictures, what you saw, uh, he got popular with uh, 
Water crystals. Yeah, water crystals, the movie What the Bleep. Well, his name is Dr. Emoto. It, that's, in, in other words, we have all this holographic information embedded even in our names. So Dr. Emoto, it's emoting. Emoting is what he's doing. His whole job is sitting there uncovering the emoting. Nassim, he uncovered this Hara line, or an, another aspect of it. He may not call it that, but in essence, that's what it is. So um, the Hara, and this is right here, this comes from someone talking about um, the Hara based on uh, Barbara Brennan's work. Even deeper than the human energy field and the chakras is the Hara line. This is a place of deep calm due to the fact that it is the zero point energy field. This is what Nassim's talking about. When he talked about Planck theory being that infinite place that once you jump inside that point within you, which is really the heart space, it opens up into infinite. And the zero point field is what you know they're calling the field, and really it's the matrix. Apparently lacking magnetic polarity, so it's actually non-dualistic. It's a point within our energy field where duality ceases to exist, which is that thing about when you know um, Rumi talks about there's a field out beyond right and wrong. I'll meet you there. Well, this space is that space. According to Britain, the Haran line is a solid pole of intentionality that runs vertically through the center of the human body connecting us upwardly to the sky and downwardly to the center of the earth. When working with a person's horror line, Brenna uh, hmm, tries to connect that person's intentionality with the center of the earth in order to foster a calm and grounded feeling. I'm not going to read all of this. Um, the main thing is I get that this horror line it's interesting that I found it in Nassim's name. Um, and she says, it goes on down here, to see, I'll read a little bit of this. Um, According to Brennan, the higher dimensional dimension is associated with the human intentionality and our soul's incarnational task to be accomplished in this body and lifetime. Brennan emphasized that the energy that she sees in the human energy field is never separate from a person's thoughts and feelings. For example, when somebody's mind is feeling calm and positive, that will be reflected in their uh, human energy field. In fact, everything a human experiences has a correlation in the energy field. Every thought, feeling, sensation, emotion can be seen in the field. Brenna notes that when she looks at the human energy field, she sees much more information than she could ever possibly communicate. So just within our own energy field, it's, it's, that, it's that nested thing, hologram thing. We have exactly all the information that's act out there. At least we have access to it. The only thing, you know, and we've all heard that metaphysically, that the answers are within, and they are. But you've got to have the right code, and the right code is simply the right consciousness or the right focus to unlock what's right in front of your face. And that's not just information, not metaphysical information, it's also the answers to your problems in your life. The black hole pattern is around all life forms. So this picture right here, I got offline. And right now, this is supposed to be the overall picture of our universe. And these little lights that you see are black holes and white holes. So this thing is supposed to be as big as we know reality is to be. But really, I, my belief is that this hologram is so deep that you cannot find the end of it. Uh, unlike in the movie 13th Floor, which I'll recommend here in a second, you know, where they do find the end of the hologram. This torus shape, a universe, has black holes and white holes, high, white hole singularities at the center of a dynamic system of expansion and contraction, bound by its own equilibrium, creating infinite potential within a finite boundary. So just like, with, just like within our bodies, we have that infinite space within us that even though we seem finite, we can tap into infinite information. I mean, we're not bound by location. Like, think about some of the long-distance stuff we played with. You know, all we need is somebody's name. That's it. You know, in the beginning when I was doing this, uh, energy work and stuff like that, you had to have their name and where they lived and the problem. But I've done experiments in groups of people where um, all you had was somebody's name. That's it. Didn't know anything else. And how accurate the information and images you get based on that. So the multiverse... Um, could re reside within a small space too. And the thing about that is, let's say that right now there is a million different Earth experiences happening simultaneously. 
But the one you're on, the one you're tuned into, is based on what? What did I say tuned you in? Your opinions, beliefs, perceptions, expectations, and judgments. So however you're projecting out, whatever a man believeth in his heart, so he is. Our galaxy. So now we're going a little bit smaller. The whole universe has got, I don't know how many galaxies in it, but it's, it's some insane number. <laughs> So at the center of our galaxy, you know, we have a black hole. And what's interesting about that, you have a black hole pulling energy in, which is the, the yin symbol, feminine, the womb, and then you have the masculine yang going out in spirals. And right there you have the yin and the yang dancing together. You have an, in, in, an internal force going in, an external going out. And um, this, is gonna be, this is very much like our own energy field. Here at the center of our heart, which is why, why I call, started calling the group Black Hole Heart, is that energy is associated with that empty space where you can tap into the infinite, can only be accessed at the center of you, which is through the heart, which has involved certain mindsets, my, certain consciousness to activate that. But all the time, no matter what, we are sending out energy, and it's rotating and coming through to us. And up here, this little hole, which is typically more, more likely up here, that's called the event horizon. So the events that are on our horizon, our future, are actually coming from what we're sending out and then it's coming back into our energy field. So we're to zoom, zoom, zoom. And why shit doesn't change for us in particular areas is we keep sending out the same crap. Here we're going to make it even smaller. We're going now into the galaxy. So you see, I'm giving you that idea of the nested feeling. And now we have our solar system. And you know I like to play with words. Literally, our solar system, from my perspective, is a larger aspect of our soul. That's why when you do a natal astrology chart, the planets are telling you your personality. Because the planets hold your personality, your soul aspect. Um, so it's not just like, okay, I'm on planet Earth and you know these other planets relate to one. No, it, it's actually a larger soul that you're inside of. And now we're down to the human energy body. And the human energy body is the exact same way. Energy is fluctuating, coming down. That's why I say that the chakras don't go forward and back like you usually see predicted or depicted. There's actually one tube down the center, and that is the Torah, which in Revelations, Jesus is the one that opens that Torah, which is the un unscrolls this access to God, basically. And... Um, we, all, we can all do that. Christ represents uh, a certain amount of consciousness within us, and when we're in that consciousness, we can open that Torah field, which unlocks our, our innate power. Wheels within wheels. Just like these little Russian dolls that stack, 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 that's exactly how our, our um, universe is, our galaxy. So here you could say you are, then you go out, there's the earth field, then you have... The earth field which is inside the solar system, the solar system which is inside the galaxy, the galaxy which is in the universe, the universe which is in the multiverse. It's like goes so far in and so far out. Like your body itself is a center point. Your body is so full of information and so vast, um, it'd be like looking out this way. Because imagine being inside your body. You actually have protons and uh, protons are actually light, or sorry, photons. Photons, they're light. So if you're inside your body, like a little point of consciousness, it would basically look like a universe or a galaxy because there's points of light radiating from different parts of the body. And um, anyway, um, just like those rushing nesting dolls, our reality is nested, 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 nested. Is everybody good with that so far? So, what? Huh? Sorry. <laughs> For sure. Um, IMAX the hologram. So you could say that the great IMAX in the sky is beaming out into the multiverse, the hologram, a myriad of experiences to be had. We are sitting in the seats, which are right down here, and having an individual experience based on where our eye focuses, which is based on our opinions, perceptions, beliefs, judgments, and expectations. So imagine that this, this huge IMAX theater this you could call is God, if you want to, the big projector in the sky, projecting out into this infinite universe all these possibilities. 
And as we're sitting here, we can access any universe, any planetary experience, anything that we focus on, or whatever our perception is based on, okay? It's interesting that the IMAX theater's got that huge dome shape, right, to give you the effect of like it's real. And, you know, imagine the technology we have now, just a hundred years in the future, we'd be doing stuff like this, seriously. There's no doubt in my mind, and there's virtual things out there that we don't even know about yet. Usually when the technology shows up in the, mult in the mainstream, it's ten years behind. That's a known fact. They're playing with stuff out there that would blow people's minds. I think it's growing exponentially. Oh yeah, and it's faster, faster, yeah, faster. Yeah, if you look at what we've done, we did, we've done more technology-wise in the last 10 years than we did in the 100 years prior to that. Yeah, and that's just that exponential boom, boom. As you learn something, it gets quicker and quicker. So you could say that here is the multiverse, and then here you are, and what you're projecting out into the multiverse is what you pull back to you to experience. So it's literally like, uh, how I get it in my mind is imagine I'm looking at something and I get pulled into it and it comes to me at the same time. It's like I merge with that reality. Does that make sense? And when you merge with that reality, what we go through to experience certain things, just like when we go to a movie, is we get emerged into characters. Okay? Think about it. When you go to a movie, you're usually... If it's a good one and you had a good experience, you usually um, uh, relate to on the characters, right? Okay? And you get to experience that movie through the character. Well, what if we're kind of doing the exact same thing? If we're already infinite, and there's not necessarily something we have to get to be quote-unquote spiritual, and the whole idea is to grow and expand from our experiences, then maybe... Maybe we have a hyperdimensional aspect out there of ourselves. Some probably call this higher self. And then we have a limited for self that we project into the hologram to have an experience. Does that make sense? Okay, what if we have a higher dimensional self, what people quote call higher self, but a hyperdimensional, it's not just one dimensional, it's not just here, it could be in lots of different places. And it projects its part of its consciousness, not completely, into the hologram to have an experience. Oh. Yeah. Plugged into the hologram first. The hyperdimensional would be like huh? sub and. Where all of that? Yeah. One in one way, yeah. Sub and Possibly. conscious levels would be in the hyperdimensional, perhaps. Uh. Now I didn't bring the sub and consciousness into this. If I had to bring it in, that's the sub would be what's, well, the sub works the same way. We have consciousness when we come in here, it's limited. So it's like, let's say you have a hyper self, okay, and then it gets nests itself smaller, which is you, your character, who you call, who you think you are, having this experience. And uh, within that, you've got a consciousness which splits up just like any other consciousness. Just like you could say that a hyperdimensional self is an individual, so it'd be like, so it'd be like three aspects of one thing, for example, God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Man, which is Jesus. So you could say you're kind of the same same construct. You're God you, your spirit self, and then the physical part of you. And um, when you come into this reality, or any, any hologram reality, there's certain restrictions that you buy into in order to have an experience. There's rules, like a game you're playing. So if you jump into a game, it's like, and that's where it will actually see this stuff start happening. Is games are already like that? You know, people put these face things on, they go into this game, and it's almost actually super real. They've got people they're talking to. It's an entirely new, rea different reality. There's not much difference between that and what we're doing, except losing the awareness that you're playing a game. Drop the awareness that you're playing a game, and now you're really playing a game. It's not just I'm pretending to play because there's always an awareness that you're playing. But what if you're projected just a little bit of yourself into an experience to gain something and learn something? But the big part of you is out here, and um, and so the little part of you has forgotten that it can unplug from that at any time. Yeah, the little the little part takes takes the game, and there's a process of that happening. We'll get into is the the little part has gotten so much into the game 
that it sees that as what's real and has lost touch with the higher reality. But that had to happen to have a certain experience and expansion of consciousness. Because otherwise you'd be really pissed at your higher self for projecting this shit. Yeah. That's one way of looking at it. Interesting thing, um, one of those little secret states, is there's a movie that's going to be coming out, it's an it's a animated movie, I think it's called Wreck'em Ralph, which is a about a, a video game character uh -huh. who's the bad guy in the, in the video game, and he gets tired of being the bad guy. <clears throat> and so he like leaves his game. Huh. Interesting. Oh. I haven't heard of that yet. Yeah, and you know how movies talk to me, so mm -hmm. I have to get chills on that one. I to check it out. Um, what do you mean in rules? You mean laws that we have here that says you kind of want to know if you Is that what you mean by that uh, one? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And well, that's our law that we're to live by here. So. But imagine being an infinite being who had no laws. But in order to come into a finite right reality, you create a game board. Yes. You create possible experiences within that, yeah, and at the same time it's dynamic, it grows and changes and takes its own form on its own. Because if consciousness, if God is consciousness, that's all that can be. So consciousness breeds consciousness, which breeds consciousness, breeds consciousness. So nothing can get away from consciousness because that's all it is, is a field of consciousness. So we're part of our higher God self just having fun playing this <laughs> Maybe. We're not having one word. Um, Experiences. Yeah. Okay. I'll so, go a little bit further so, to paint the picture. So, uh -huh. how, how do you... Okay. That's why I said, I'm we're going gonna, gonna to blow here. some circuits I'm tonight. Here, no <laughs> uh, there's a there question I want to ask. Yeah, 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 sure. There is one. Okay. Uh, and I, I lost it, but it's coming back to me. Okay. If this is the case, and we say that this is so, and this is what we believe, then um, we, we've just bought into the system, and in order to find uh, another way, another reality for ourselves, what is the key? Hmm? Is it our changing our mind? Is that it? Um, say that one more time. You said... Okay, we're, we're here in this reality right now uh -huh. because that's basically what we think that we've chosen. Right. We chose this game. Yeah. And then okay. if we want to be, um, be in a different reality, possibly in another world that we want to create, is it just a matter of tapping into spirit and changing our mind, which is our spirit, changing it? Changing what our perception of what we want to be. Yeah, that's that's one level of it. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to explain that all because I've tried to put answer it as much as I can here. Yes. But write anything down. Of course, ask me. But I think this will explain it as I go along. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna tell you how I've come to this place. Ready? So y'all know how movies talk to me. Okay. So y'all know I had a big hard on for the Adjustment Bureau. <laughs> And um, that movie, The Adjustment Bureau, really started working in my mind, okay? And basically, The Adjustment Bureau could be described as what they call the game model, okay? Remember in this movie, these two are in love? If you haven't seen it, I'll try not to blow the end. Well, I don't know that I can do that, but... The, uh, I this is a movie I recommend... Who cares if he doesn't blow the end? Yeah, even if he tells you what happens at the end, you still need to watch it. Yeah, I, I think you need to, whenever I mention a movie in here, I recommend you watch it. Especially after what I'm going to talk about tonight, because even if you've seen it before, I recommend you watch it. why it's coming up. Yes, why I'm sharing it and why I was led to it is particular information. So, here you have these two people that are in love, and come to find out there's people behind the scenes, we may call them angels, guides, whatever, they're controlling everything. They even make people die to have certain things stay on track. Well, these two fall in love and come to find out they've, they've met each other numerous times in their lifetime, but they kept getting separated by the group because they, they had such a strong magnetic attraction that she was to come into his life to always stimulate him, like amuse in a way for him to do good things. Like doing this really good speech he did after he met her again for like the fourth time. Anyway, he, he finds out something. He, he sees what's behind the scenes of things. And they tell him that 
he cannot be with her because that's not the plan. So he, he, he goes away from her. He doesn't, you know, that's the game plan, right? Follow the rules. So he follows the rules because that's what he's told to do. And there's, there's a, a threat that they, you know, they can harm her career. And she's a ballet person. Uh, but anyway, at the, at, at the end, they, their desire to have their life and control over it and be together overrides the rules. Okay? That's, and that's where the, everybody in this room is on the edge of being. Okay? You're at the edge of seeing this. Okay? Because you don't get out of the game until you see the game. You'll be in it forever because that's the way it's designed. You're not, you're not, you're not going to get out until you've seen it. So towards the end, in this book, this book that the guys with the hats carry, there's this map. And it tells you where these two people, it shows their, how they cross their paths and everything. It tells them, it tells these guys how to keep them in line and keep them on the game board. But in the end, oops, in the end, Spirit tells them, or the chief, you can say, they don't really say that who that is, but you can say God or whatever, since their desire is more, uh, or t since they can see a God, the Spirit, whatever, the chief, let's just say the chief is what they call can see their desire, he lets them have free reign. And what happens is, this clip that I froze was, here's the map, and then they're now off of it. They're writing their own thing. They're playing in the game, but they're writing their own rules. They're no longer like slave characters within a, in a story. It's like when you get to the end of a video game, and then you can play God mode. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and, and, throughout the, and throughout games, you pick up certain items, certain information, certain powers, especially the long ones, what they call character role games, like Zelda and things like that. Those are very in-depth, long games where you're playing this long thing. And you think, you know, this can't really be, we can't really be part of this, but think about it. Why do we love drama so much? I mean, seriously, why do you watch TV? You, to get lost in an experience. Why do you go to a movie? Why do you play a game? Why, why, why? it's because we, the consciousness loves to experience and expand itself, period. That's what it's all about. Another movie I really like, um, this one's not so popular, it's called The Thirteenth Floor. Uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, but uh, you can watch this movie and imagine that it's exactly like Thirteenth Floor, and you'll get the point. Uh, I recommend you check it out. Even if you've already seen it, you may get a little extra something from it after setting through this presentation. And the byline there says you can you can go there even though it doesn't exist. <laughs> so where do you fit into all this? Um, the shape of the hologram is called a toroidal field. I've already color, uh, covered that. And you know how I love words. So if you break that down, you get Torah dial. It's a round dial. So our energy field is how we dial into certain experiences, which is still based on our opinions, perceptions, belief. Judgments are the huge thing. Judgments keep you playing a game that you may be tired of playing. And you can't get free of it unless you give up your judgments. And the, the, when this started happening to me, we have a shitload more judgments than we can even understand. And that's what locks us into the game. Seriously, I mean, even the concept of spirituality is a judgment. Judgment means if something is this, it is not that. And if infinite is infinite, there is no label that can be put on the infinite. So in order to come, in, so in order to come into this game, we label things, like Adam in the example of Genesis labeled things to set the construct up. So you can say that actually Adam and Eve is the story of setting up this game board. Yeah. Um, and in, in a game, you actually have a huge game board. Sometimes they're huge. Like you can go to different planets in these computer games. And that's technology that us little, you know, haven't evolved much beings, at least perceivingly, have created. And maybe the reason we do that is because it's ingrained in us to always create and expand our consciousness. So creating a soul in and from the IMAX holographic soul a solar system. <laughs> so imagine you're out here, you're a little toroidal field too, and you beam some consciousness into the solar system, and as a result of doing that, you create a little soul self. Creating a soul in the solar system, I already talked about this, so you beam, beam, 
And the sun, remember the natal, star, natal chart? You always talk about your sun. You know, somebody can ask you, what's your sign, man? The sign is your sun sign, typically. The sun sign is where the sun is in a certain constellation based on when you're born. So when you're born, I imagine, you know anything that you buy at the store has that, what they call a UPC, a unit, a unit of price uh, code, universal price code? I call it product code, thank you. I, we get a UPC stamped on us, which is a universal personality code, as soon as we're born. That's what your astrology chart is. Your astrology chart tells you what your character is playing in the game. But the thing about that is that's not entirely who you are completely. And you don't have to play by certain rules once you become completely aware of that. You can start playing different rules in different games. So, in essence, we bar being part of ourselves into a limited reality to play, experience, and grow, which takes a lot of the seriousness out of it. You know, I've just had this whole serious spiritual thing. I've really got to really get really spiritual to be saved, and God is only loving and spiritual, and i got to be spiritual to be get into that realm. Uh, but what if it is, all we're doing is playing with expanded consciousness? I'll, I'll, I'll try to say this in a couple different ways to get it even deeper. It is kind of like us using a pair of gloves to perform a specific action. The gloves are something you put on you or uh, put, put part of you in, but they aren't you. One's natal astrology chart explains your glove or gloves. So basically, if I want to like work outside and not harm my hands, I put on this shell and do something. But you could say, looking at my hands when I have the gloves on, they're doing something, right? But really, it's the essence inside. You take the glove off, it's just... It can't do anything by itself. It's, yeah, it cannot, that's the key thing. It cannot do anything by itself. <clears throat> I could go a couple of ways from here, most of which would blow people's minds. I choose to stay focused on how the information may be helped to help us, to bring it more home, to bring it home for us to use. So where do you fit in all of this? Just as the toroidal field is used over and over to create reality, so too is the same mathematics used. This means we live in a hologram. We could see, if we live in a hologram, we could see repeated patterns everywhere. And that's true, the Fibonacci sequence. Um, we, we're basically, what we're seeing, once you start becoming aware of that, once you wake up to that, which most, not, I'm, change that. I'm not saying most don't know, but a lot of people are unaware of the Fibonacci and things like that, right? You start becoming aware of that once you start realizing and seeing a similar code everywhere. In other words, you're starting to see the construct or the math, uh, the computer language that this game was created on. That's all I've been doing all this time is like the sphenoid, seeing how that is really the Ark of the Covenant and the story, all the stories in the Bible are actually reflected in the body. That's like code. In so the Matrix the, when they're watching the exactly. Exactly. So, uh, and then you notice when you, if you know what you're reading, you can see the images pop out, right? Exact same hologram idea. So, in the Bible, the Torah, uh, there's this thing called the uh, Bible code, where looking at these different Hebrew letters in a different mathematical sequence, you get different stories. To the degree that you can actually look up some past experience um, using mathematics, and out of the Torah, it'll take you to a particular page and see how these crisscrossing based on the page, and it'll, like, Kennedy's assassination talks about president, says the year, all this shit encoded in the Torah. So this mathematical information is stored in everywhere. And basically you could do this with Moby Dick too, the book Moby Dick. That's why movies and books you read have code in them. Because you cannot, because you're living in code, you cannot help but use code. So imagine being in the matrix, you know, looking at that green stuff, but you're in the matrix and you're typing on your typewriter, which looks real to you. It's really just typing out this code, right? Yes, Marcia? There's a guy that did the same thing with the Bible. Yeah, and you can do that with the Bible too. The Torah was where it started, but then they started experimenting. And then the thing I saw where they did it with Moby Dick too. So there's codes hitting in everything, absolutely everything. And then once you start seeing that code, you start realizing you're, you're on the, what I'm going to talk, tell you to talk about in a second, is the upswing. You're on the way out of the game. John. Yeah. Where, where would you, where would you, an out-of-body, say an out-of-body experience, when someone's having surgery or giving birth or whatever, when they have that out-of-body experience, mm -hmm. would you say that's, 
their soul. I mean, that body's still alive. But right. What's up here looking down on that body? It could be. It could be that guy talking about the hyperdimensional higher self. Imagine somebody's being operated on, and that consciousness, instead of being focused there, begin is allowed to expand, and maybe the drugs help. You know, lots of people say they tie that experience when they go to sleep at night. So maybe it's not just during operation, but operation is a way of, you know, keeping um, you you deadened and knocked out. But there's also a conscious part there, so you're aware of the separation. But maybe that separation happens a lot more than we think, yeah. in certain instances. So I went over this last Sunday, but I want to go over a few things before I go a little bit deeper. So here, you can see my rendition of the Torah field, okay, the toroidal field. Here you've got the tree of, um, uh, of judgment, the tree of good and bad. But actually, what happens is, when we're going down, it's like this tree is flipped upside down. This is just coming to me, so I guess it's whatever it is. So the tree is flipped upside down, and it's the chi, the chi, the tree of good and bad. When it flips back up, it's the tree of life. And when, depending on the direction you're going, that perception changes. And the, which direction you're going will, will make that more sense in a second. So, um, some interesting things about here. In the kundalini that raises up the center of the spine is depicted by two snakes that intertwine. On the left side is called itta, which is feminine and the masculine is Pingala. So the biblical story of Genesis is a story of our own energy, Pingala and the Itta. Remember, remember the feminine came out of the masculine? It, the masculine could have come out of the feminine too, it doesn't matter. This says that they're of the same energy is basically what it's saying. It's saying it's a yin and a yang. And the serpent at the base, or the serpent on the tree, the serpent, you know, you know I've shared this before, like that chokere symbol is actually a symbol for the snake. And, and that chokere symbol represents kundalini energy. So the snake that Adam and Eve are tempted by is this kundalini energy, this raw energy, that if you wanted to have a reason for being here would be to have the experience of controlling and directing that energy where we want it instead of it controlling us, tempting us and directing us where, where it wants to go. In other words, we, we're the slave, not the master of it. Another thing, the chakra system, here that I depicted on the tree, and in the toroidal field you got this huge tube down the center and that's called a torsion tube and the Torah in Revelations is this sacred scroll is the sacred scroll that only Christ can open and my interpretation of that is our, a certain amount of consciousness, Christ consciousness if you will is the only one that can open up those seals completely within us. And Christ's consciousness is non-judgment. That's all, that's all to me Christ's consciousness is. I've tried to label it a different way, but it came to me recently. It's just, just non-judgment. There's absolutely no judgment. Think about who Christ hung around with. He hung around with prostitutes. He hung around with the low life. And he was about trying to empower the lower ones, right? Which would be like the lower chakras, too. So non-judgment is the only way to access the heart space that gives you access to infinite realm of information, um, which is like the black hole, what I call the black hole heart. So this toroidal field is how you dial into consciousness, because you're projecting out of that into reality or onto it. I mean, that could be debated. Um, so our judgments, and this is in Revelations here, our judgments caused us to fall from grace, and at the same time, was needed for our experiences here. So we had to go through judgment to get where we are now, or we, or we would not be, um, we wouldn't be able to feel the experience is real. It would be like, I'm playing a video game, and I know whatever happens in there, I don't have to take it serious. But, imagine if you jumped into something, and there was a process that you went to, that you believed in it so much, that everything that happened to you, you took as real, so that you could have a very deep, deep experience. If I'm playing a video game or if I'm watching a movie, I may have feelings there, but I don't take it too personal. I can still step back from it, right? right. But what if the name of the game is a little bit different? And it's more advanced than that. So um, the serpent is interesting, the, the kundalini energy. If you play at the word serpent, you can get repent. And repent is to com uh, commit to personal change 
resolving to live a more responsible life where one, uh, when one repents, they are spared God's judgment. So we came into this reality, we're taught all the, you know, we're taught the rules from our parents, right? As soon as we come in, we're programmed with all the rules and the judgments to lock us into character. Maybe if we didn't have that, our experience of reality would be completely different. But we were, we were, we were, as soon as we're born, you get those programs put into you to cause the limitation to where you feel like it's really real. Maybe it'd be totally different. I can't tell you what that would be. Um, but, because I don't know of anybody out there that hadn't had any kind of programming. <laughs> we're going to go over, th over this in the next few... Huh? A baby to an extent. But then the baby has all past generations. True, true. Yeah, there's... A baby to a small. Yeah. But, what if... No. Okay, fall of man. Fall of man is we have judgment, the concept of separation, the first emotion in Genesis that man had after eating the apple was fear of God, fear. And all this leads to discomfort. And I found an error in my last writing, and I'm going to correct that with this group. Um, and then, on the way up, so if you're going down, you're in slavery mode. When you're going up, you're in freedom mode, which is, is ascension in New Age terms. And to ascend, you've got to go through your discomfort to clear these emotions, clear the separation, which is opinions, perceptions, beliefs, expectations, and clear your judgment. And I've already said this, it says, Rumi again, out beyond the ideas of right and wrongdoing, there is an infinite field, matrix, hollow ground, holy ground, I will meet you there. All Buddhas, all Christ beings, enlightened beings, live in non-judgment reality. And uh, creation, your environment, which is inside of you, uh, which is your opinions, perceptions, beliefs, expectations, judgments, prepares you, prepares and sinks you, puts you together with certain experiences, quote unquote, out there in your environment, which is the environment is the hologram. Okay? You with me so far? 